Well, good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing tonight? On this cold, dark, rainy Good Friday. Amen. Thank you for not staying home in your PJs tonight. Appreciate you coming out and celebrating with us on this Good Friday evening. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, we are so thankful that we can gather together tonight and honor you for what you have done for us, Lord, on Good Friday, the time that you went to an old rugged cross and you took our place and our sins upon you and you died in our place, the place where we should have been, Lord, but you did that for us and we could never be grateful enough except to just love you serve you in the best way that we know how, give our lives back to you, Lord. Be with us in this service tonight. We pray that um, your Holy Spirit would fill the sanctuary, and Father, that each heart would be touched in some way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a minute, we're going to sing a song, The Old Rugged Cross. If We're going to sing a couple songs tonight, and if you need the words to those, they're pretty easy songs, The Old Rugged Cross and Beneath the Cross of Jesus. But if you need the words, we've got some in the back, and they'd be glad to hand them out to you if you just kind of wave your hand at somebody back there, and they will hand them out to you. Tonight, you know, Pastor Jody and I, we, we talked about the service tonight and, and uh, how we wanted it to go. And, you know, we could stand up here and, and uh, preach a sermon all night long, which, which would be good, not all night. Not, not all night, no, no. <laughs> a couple hours, maybe. But Pastor Jody thought it would be a great idea if we told you the story of Jesus prophesying about his birth, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his death. If we just let the Holy Spirit out of the Bible, out of God's own word tell you that story once again. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And I'm going to start by reading you some verses that pertain to Jesus prophesying about his death and telling or foretelling it in a way to his disciples. So I'm going to read some scriptures out of Matthew here and one out of John. And it goes like this, starting in Matthew chapter 16. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to his disciples, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. And as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way, he said to them, see, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. And finally, he said, and now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. God bless the reading of his word. All right, let's sing the old rugged cross, shall we? Y'all help me out tonight? Okay, here we go. You want to stand? Stand up. I was going to give you a break tonight. Here we go. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of loss. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trope at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross so despised by the world 
world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down last time to the old rugged cross I will ever be Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for till my trophies at last I lay down. Man, you may be seated. Thank you so much. As our volunteers get ready, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. On the Passover that Jesus was with his disciples, we call it the Last Supper. Jesus was making a point that the bread, the bread was a symbol of Jesus' body that would be destroyed on the cross for mankind. And he was making a point that the fruit of the vine, the juice, was a symbol of the blood that Jesus shed for us, that cleanses us from our sins. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that following the tradition of the Lord's Supper, we remember the Lord's death until he comes. But Paul also tells us that if we come to the table in an unworthy manner, we dishonor the memory of Jesus in his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, But a man must examine himself. In so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so to make ourselves examine, we go to the Father, we confess our sin, and then we offer a word of gratitude. Heavenly Father, forgive me my sin. Thank you. And so we're going to take a moment and, and give everyone an opportunity to come before the Lord so there's nothing between us and the Lord, so there'll be nothing between us and Jesus. And so we're going to take just a moment, and after a moment, I'm going to ask Pastor J.R. to ask a blessing for the cup and the bread. Father, we are so thankful again to be here tonight. As I mentioned earlier, Father, this is the time that you took our place. You mm -hmm. took our sins upon you. 
When God looks down at us, he doesn't see us, our unrighteousness, because there is filthy rags. What he sees is you, his only begotten son, and the fact that you became the sacrificial lamb for our lives. We pray that as we take this cup and this bread tonight, that we remember that it represents the blood that you shed and your body that hung on that cross for us and was broken. Father, just help us to be the best we can be, Lord, and serve you the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this, share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and, and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is being given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on this table. If you take the cup and turn it so that the small side is up, and then peel back the lid, there's the wafer. And I find it interesting that before Christ broke the bread, he blessed it. Then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. And if you turn the cup over to the juice side, Peel it back. And then Jesus said, this cup which is given for you is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And if you hold on to your cups, our volunteers are going to bring some baskets and collect the cups for you.
turn my mic on so you can hear me. About Jesus' arrest. Matthew chapter 26. And Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus. And two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I urge you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, there will come a time you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, saying, He is blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the 27th chapter. Now when morning had come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him up to Pilate, the Roman governor. And Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of Jews? And Jesus answered and said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And Jesus did not answer him with regard even to a single charge, so that the governor was amazed. And Pilate said to the chief priests, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people, they answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And after weaving a crown of thorns, thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took his robe off and put his garments on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to carry Jesus' cross. And they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they put up above his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. We're going to sing another song tonight. And uh, it's beneath the cross of Jesus. So you want to stand again? Let's stand again, shall we? Maybe get a little more breath. You can sing out a little more this time. (laughs) 
beneath the cross of Jesus. Here we go. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. A weary land, a home within the wilderness, upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. There lies beneath its shadow And there between us stands the cross of stripes to save, like a watchman set to guard the way from that eternal grave. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. Content to let the world go by Only shame my glory all the cross Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Jesus' crucifixion, Mark 27. And at that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at Jesus, wagging their head and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking Jesus and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and then we shall believe in him. He trusts in God. Then let God deliver him. And one of the cr criminals who was hanged there with Jesus was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sakbakthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, then Pilate ordered it to be given over to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. At this time, we're going to have Jan come up and sing Via Dolorosa for us. God bless you, dear.
the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day. The soldiers tried to clear the narrow street, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa called the way of suffering. Like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. Dolorosa, triste bien Jerusalem. Los soldados labran paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se secaba para ver que llevaba que a cruz. Por la vía dolorosa, es la vía del dolor. Dolorosa al Calvario y morir. The blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way to the heart of governor of Judea had Jesus beaten. The soldiers made a crown of thorns and they pressed it about his head. And then in a way to mock him, they put a purple robe on him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. The chief priests and the elders of the synagogue shouted, crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to the crowd, look, your king. And the Jews answered, we have no king but Caesar. And Pilate handed Jesus over to the soldiers and they crucified him, him in the middle and a thief on either side. 
And Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And after the death of Jesus, the apostle John, in his gospel, continues the story for us. Now then, since it was the day of preparation to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews requested of Pilate that their legs be broken and their bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other man who was crucified with him. But after they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And they did not break his legs. Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And I, John, who has seen, has testified, and my testimony is true, and I know that what I am telling is the truth, so that you may believe. For these things took place so that the scripture would be filled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. The Christian holiday that we call Good Friday is the day that Christians observe the crucifixion, the death, and the burial of Jesus Christ. It is literally the worst named holiday in the history of the world. On Father's Day, we remember our fathers. On Mother's Day, we remember our mothers, but we don't celebrate those days because of the death of our mothers and fathers. And so as we come to celebrate Good Friday, doesn't it seem like a paradox to remember the death of Jesus? And some people have suggested maybe that instead of Good Friday, good means pure, our holy, and the, the title of the holiday should be Holy Friday. But even if you use the name Holy Friday, it does not make the events of the day seem any brighter to me. And you know, I get it. I understand that three days after his burial, Jesus was raised from the grave. I know that in the resurrection, Jesus is the first of millions to live again. And I understand that by my faith, I will be raised up with Jesus into the heavenly place at some time in my future. But in the middle of my grief, at the death of a loved one, don't try to tell me about joyful things. The Bible tells us there's a time to weep and a time to mourn. And tonight, we are remembering the death of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. And we thank you, God, that you've given it to us as a gift. And we pray this evening you would illuminate your word to us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open our ears and our eyes. Open our hearts so that we might understand your word. And Lord, we would tell you thank you. Thank you in advance for hearing our prayers. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 2,000 years ago, the bodies of the criminals who were crucified by the Romans, they were left to rot on the cross. You see, it was a simple, very effective way to remind other lawbreakers of the consequences of sin. And it must have been horrible to see that sight of the decaying body for days, sometimes weeks, Awful to see the birds pecking at the flesh, and the smell must have been horrendous. But that's the thing, that's the way things were done 2,000 years ago when you crossed the wrong people. But today, something is different. Something is different as the Apostle John relates the days of the event. You know, the tradition of the Jews written in Deuteronomy, gives them this direction. Now, if a person is put to death and you hang him on the tree, 
His, de- his body is not to be left overnight, but you shall certainly bury it on the same day. It was the Jewish leaders who requested that the man's legs be broken so that death would come quickly so their bodies would be taken down. They were not sorry about the death of an innocent man. They were more concerned for their integrity of their tradition. And so it was the Jews who ran to Pilate. It was the Jews who pleaded for the Romans to break the legs of the men on the crosses. You see, the Jews wanted to see the the death of Jesus Christ as fast as he could die. And for Pilate, what did he care about the body of a dead man? He didn't care about the life of any man. And a soldier? A soldier is only required what a soldier is ordered to do, and so they came in a hurry, and they broke a dying man's legs. And notice that even the thief who was promised a place in paradise only moments before, he suffered an agonizing death. No one, not a thief on the cross, not a member of this church, not the Lord Jesus himself, is ever promised an easy, peaceful, pain-free life on earth. What the Bible does promise is that we get to spend eternity with the Lord in paradise. It's another paradox in this Easter weekend. Even the cruelest death on earth still brings us into the arms of God. And so the legs of the two thieves were broken to speed up their death. But the same treatment is not true of Jesus because he was already dead. And so on Good Friday, we might say thank you to God that Jesus was suffered this brutal abuse. And still, the cruelty to his body continued as a soldier pierced his side with a spear. Roman soldiers knew what death looked like. They studied dead. And Jesus was dead, proved by a skill of a soldier with a spear that was thrust into his chest. And their excuse is to make sure that a blameless man was dead. On this Good Friday, our Lord, dead, nailed to a cross with one final insult to his body, was stabbed through the heart. Good Friday? I don't think so. So I wonder, why did Jesus have to die like this? And when the Apostle Paul wrote the Corinthians, he said this, For I gave to you what had been passed down to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures foretold. If you have a moment this evening, do me a favor. Find your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John in the Gospel or in the chapter 19 and get your husband, get your wife, get your children, call a friend on a phone and read about the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you're going to find that when John writes about the death of Jesus, you're going to read this phrase over and over so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Why did Jesus die like this? It was the fulfillment of Scriptures. In the passage that we read, two things were predicted. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And he must be pierced. On a day full of irony, there's, no, there's a positive and a negative. Jesus Christ's bones must not be broken. And on the same day, he must be pierced. On Good Friday, when man is confused and the day's event just don't make any sense, Do we realize that it is God alone who could have foreseen the actions of the soldiers and foretold their deeds so exactly? There are prophecies of Jesus from his birth to his tomb. 
and they have all been carried out to the letter. The brutality of Jesus' death is written in the prophets. And the apostle John, who has witnessed these events with his own eyes, has written them down so that we may believe. Roman soldiers have broken the legs of two, but they have executed three. Jesus' legs could not have been broken, and his side had to be pierced. It could be no other way. And do we understand that these prophecies, these prophecies were not written about a man, but the Messiah, the Savior of mankind. And his death on the cross in this very exact fashion proves that this innocent man on the cross named Jesus was the Son of God. It could be no one else. The scriptures foretold it. Jesus saw, John saw it with his own eyes. The scriptures were proved so that we might believe. In the law of Moses, the sacrifice for sin was a bloody event. At the sacrifice of a lamb, it's recorded in the book of Leviticus. And the New Testament book of Hebrews tells us that there has to be, for forgiveness of sin, a blood ransom. According to the law, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God showed Israel. He shows us that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, gives us the forgiveness of sin and removes our punishment. And we read the pages of the Bible and there are precious few men and women who understood Jesus' place in this world that Jesus would have to die in a most awful way. And one of them was John the Baptist. And when he saw Jesus walking toward him, Jesus said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There needs to be a sacrifice for sin, and it needs to include blood. And so I think about it like this. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. My friends, Jesus was not our Lamb. But for the forgiveness of our sins, God's Lamb could only be killed in God's way. Here's my son. Beat him. Whip him. Spit in his face. Pound nails into his head hands until he is dead, then pierce his side, but do not break his bones. His death could not be any other way. And this death was designed for only one person. Jesus Christ, our Savior. So on Good Friday, let me ask you, what is Christ to you? Is he a good man? Is he a teacher? Is Jesus a prophet? Or is he your Savior who died a horrible death to save you from death and give you eternal life? Because if Jesus is your Savior, you are complete in him and you are perfect. Your sins are forgiven. But today... Just like 2,000 years ago, there's no way that there's been a change in the way the world treats Jesus Christ. The world despises him. They reject his offer. And the world mocks those who call him Lord. And on this most paradoxical holiday called Good Friday, let's remember two things before the day ends. Jesus gave his life for you for one reason. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And while Jesus' death on the cross was the sweetest song ever sung by God the Father to us, and his song to us is a love song, 
while this is not a happy day, maybe, maybe when we remember the love song that God sings to us, maybe that makes it a good Friday. Because as sad as this day is, we still have a promise from God. Weeping may endure for a night, but a shout of joy cometh in the morning. May God bless us on this Good Friday. God be praised. Let's all stand as we close. And let's sing a couple verses of Jesus Paid It All. What a, an appropriate song. Amen? You think of all the countless sacrifices that were made year after year, over and over. But Jesus came, and Jesus, once and for all, paid it all. Everything that we needed to take on ourselves, he took upon him. Let's sing that together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find it be thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall repeat. Jesus, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let's pray. Father, once again we thank you for allowing us to be here this evening. And Father, as we leave here and we put aside your death and your burial, we look forward to that day when we can celebrate your resurrection. Father, that is the proof that everyone needed to believe that you said and did exactly what you were sent here to do, and that is to die and be resurrected for our eternal life. We praise you and we honor you for that. Keep us safe and healthy as we head out this evening, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. God bless you.